Thank you for having me. Um, so it's always fun to first start the talks to see how many people have actually been uh, genotyped. How many of you have spat? Oh, good. A good number of you. Well, congratulations. You are part of big data, and you are part of our research. Um, so uh, I changed the title of the talk to crowdsource research, better, faster, cheaper. And I will walk through um, uh, some of the research we have been doing. So just for those of you who do not know what we do, 23andMe is a personal genome company. We enable any of you in the room to order, go online, order a kit, get a little tube, you spit, you send it back through the regular mail, and roughly two weeks later, we send you back an email that says your genome is ready. And what we do is we create the software interface so that you can understand your genome from the health to the ancestry, um, and then keeping up with the latest discoveries and being able to participate in research. So I'm not going to go much into that because that's not really um, 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 the focus of this area of this conference, but really going to focus more on the big data in 23andMe. And um, when we started the company, it was really um, it was about empowering you and, and enabling all this genetic information to come to you, but really with this idea that consumers can potentially change the entire healthcare system by coming together, that there was all these fiefdoms of, of research pockets that, you know, um, academics have theirs, pharma has theirs, a lot of information is not shared, um, and that's not necessarily in the best interest of you and I. So, so what we can do is if we all come together, we can actually share all of, all of our information, and we can generate these discoveries. So that is the fundamental mission of 23andMe. So a few updates. We now have over 180,000 customers, making us one of the largest databases out there. So for, if you look at most of the clinical studies, it's usually in the thousands of individuals. With 180,000 individuals, we can actually do a tremendous amount of research. The way we re do research is we get people like you to come and to spit, um, and then we ask them to take surveys. And that could be anything from uh, fun topics like cilantro, if you want to, uh, you know, do you like cilantro or does it taste like soap, to more serious things like cancer, family history, and psoriasis, Parkinson's disease, et cetera. So um, what's been amazing is how successful the survey functionality is and how much customers want to give us data. And we're actually collecting over a million new data points from our customers every single week. So this has led to us to be, to, to be able to do actually a tremendous amount of research. So this is a publication that came out um, where we actually were able to replicate 180 um, genetic associations, all with self-report data and all from our customers. So it showed this idea that by collecting this one database, this one group of customers, and again, not a specific disease group, not a specific kind of cohort, but just the general population, we're actually able to do a massive amount of research incredibly efficiently, so 180 genetic uh, associations replicated. So that's led us to actually do all kinds of other research topics, and this is actually a list of all of our abstracts that are being presented in two weeks at the human genetics meeting, and you can see it ranges from interesting topics like breast size to morphological traits to sexual orientation to BRCA um, to actually information about our exome pilot and how we actually did that exome pilot. So at ASHG in two weeks, um, the human genetics meeting will have 18 posters and two talks. So all of this is great, um, but, but what's going to become incredibly fascinating and challenging for all of us is the sequencing revolution and the fact that there is going to be so much data that's being generated. And the challenge with the sequencing revolution is that we have tons of this information we just don't know about. So in my genome, uh, when I got sequenced, you know, I have roughly 4 million um, uh, variants known in my genome. And in my exome, which is the coding region, I have about 80,000 variants just in my exome, but about 6,000 of those have never been seen before. So as you can imagine, the, you know, 23andMe gives you a lot of information that's about you that we know what that means, um, but there's tons. As, as sequencing becomes cheap, the challenge is that there's tons of this information we don't know what it means, and it's a question of how are we going to figure that out. So I actually have 1,000 variants that are associated with disease, but, but I'm actually relatively healthy, knock on wood, um, and, and I actually have 100 variants that lead to a loss of function. So theoretically, there should be, there's like a hundred different ways, literally, my family can point to a hundred ways that there could be something wrong with me. Um, so, so, so how are we going to figure out what all this information means? Um, because the vast, the vast majority of these variants are of, of unknown significance. So that's the common terminology, variants of unknown significance. So again, that's what gets to 23andMe. By having the big data set, 
we can start to make sense of this. And there's two ways we can actually do that. One is um, something called genome-wide association studies, where we look at a disease group, um, so something like diabetes, and you look to see what are all the genetic variants potentially associated with that. Um, what 23andMe now is pretty uniquely set up to do is what we call FIWA studies, which is phenotype association studies. And what, what that means is that we can actually look at a genetic variant and we look and see what are all the various traits that are associated with that. So in this instance, you could look at this you know, specific SNP in, in a gene and see, OK, is it associated with type 2 diabetes or Parkinson's? Um, and that's actually becoming incredibly valuable for us to do as we are sequencing lots of information. We don't know what these, these, uh, v these variants mean. So this is an example that actually came to us where a family came to us where there was three family members that had pancreatic cancer. And, um, and that, it was enough, enough pancreatic cancer that they felt like there was a strong familial component. They got sequenced by um, you know, Stanford and Yale and, um, and a bunch of groups that Broad looked at it. And everybody sort of concluded that this one variant, uh, P603R, was the likely variant that was causing this familial history of pancreatic cancer. It's in a gene called MLH1, which is known for hereditary colon cancer. And it was quite likely, that's a relatively significant change in the protein, it was a quite likely that that was the causative variant for pancreatic cancer. And so uh, the family came to us saying, well, like, well, like, what, like is, this, is this right? Is this actually the variant? Because um, they wanted to test the kids. They wanted to know what the fault Like, is this actually the variant? So in the traditional model, as many of you know, you know, you would, uh, you would do a grant. You would uh, you know, do a grant to do some basic research. And the grant process is, you know, any for up to two years. Um, and it's most likely not to be funded. So this is where 23andMe comes in. Um, because we actually knew what this variant was, uh, we were able to look in the 23andMe database. I went to one of our trusty scientists. And uh, 48 hours later, um, I actually got this data that we have 56 other customers in the database that carry that exact same variant. So if it's a highly penetrant variant causing the pancreatic cancer, it's most likely that some of these 56 individuals would also have a familial history of pancreatic cancer, or they themselves would actually have pancreatic cancer. So um, we then looked more, and we actually saw there was 19 who had not retaken the survey, but 26 had said that they don't have cancer, and one had colon cancer. So, um, so that's a pretty compelling argument that this is not the factor that was actually causing the pancreatic cancer in this family. So, um, so again, we just, in 48 hours, we were able to save this family a tremendous amount of time and money because it was just a data query. And that's more and more, that's sort of the whole purpose of what 23andMe is trying to do, is make research just sort of a data query, enable all these people to come together, and then just, just enable all the researchers out there to just query the data to find, make discoveries like this. So um, because we wanted more data, uh, we ended up putting together something called the Cancer Family History, where we put out, we wanted to know, do these individuals potentially have a family history of cancer? Um, and again, in 36 hours, we got 12,000 responses. So that's pretty phenomenal for people who are doing research to know that you can just get that much data that quickly. All you had to do was put out a survey. So, um, so incredibly fast. So um, this has led us to actually start taking on some more initiatives where we actually have a few very specific disease communities where um, what we find is that individuals want to, when they, they have a disease of unmet need, they actually want to bond together and they want to come and actually try to make a difference. So Parkinson's has been... Uh, our largest community, um, you can see that we have actually, this number is the light, we have almost 9,000 individuals who are enrolled, um, everyone from, you know, Muhammad Ali to, um, um, you know, Michael J. Fox to, to again, sort of your, your average individuals. And what we find is actually individuals are coming and saying, I don't even have a computer, um, but, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the library, I'm going to make sure that I'm actually taking my survey. So it's, again, it's an incredibly engaged cohort of individuals. Um, so this was a, a, a paper that came out uh, a couple years ago, and it, was a, uh, it showed that there was a, um, a link, an association between Parkinson's disease and a variant called um, GBA. And uh, so we saw this come out, and again, you can, for those of you, again, in this industry, you know, all those, all those authors means that it's uh, a lot of money. So this was, I think, a three-center study, uh, lots of individuals participating in it, um, and we look at that, it's probably a few million dollars that went into this kind of study. So, um, you know, again, I went to our science team, and, and lo and behold, in 48 hours, 
we were actually able to replicate this exact study. So again, kind of giving that idea that research should be, if you have a big data set, research should actually be able to be real time. Um, so I love this quote, what 23andMe did in a matter of years would have taken several decades and tens of millions of dollars if done conventionally. And again, hearing some of the things that Jamie Haywood had said, exactly the thought, we need to actually take a different approach to research. And I think one of the underutilized uh, resources in this entire research community is, is the individual. And instead of treating individuals like human subjects, you know, make them a participant, make them actually a partner in this research. So if you can bring the world together, all that research data, um, bring it all together, you could actually dramatically transform how we're doing some of these things. So, um, so what 23andMe is now doing, um, this hasn't launched yet, but this is the direction that we are going, is that it should not just be 23andMe that is sitting on top of all of this data. That if you're an individual who has sarcoma, or you're an individual who has um, you know, some kind of leukemia, you don't just want 23andMe to have this data. You want anyone who, any qualified academic or, or researcher who, who has that brain capacity to, to get access to this information. So what 23andMe is working to do is actually to say all those 180,000 individuals or potentially those millions of people in the future should be accessible to any qualified researcher in the world. And how great would it be that you know, one day, if looking at our Parkinson's community, where you know, we have a, I have a family history of Parkinson's disease, that it wouldn't just be us and you know, a few small researchers looking at this data, but millions, you know, thousands of researchers could actually be getting access to this data. So this is something that 23andMe will be launching soon. You'll hear more about this at the human genetics meeting that's coming up. Uh, and the last thing that we've actually uh, recently launched is, is the API. Um, I'm so glad you guys like it. Um, so, so again, this is part of our philosophy, is that it's, it's your genome, and, um, and, and we want to be sort of that central hub of being able to aggregate all this information and, and keep you engaged, but it should be all of you out there to, to develop the creative applications, that there's so much creativity out there, and 23andMe has done a number of things like um, you know, the Neanderthal and the Music Lab, and there's all kinds of creative things that we hear, and, and we were being contacted day and day out over by, by individuals who wanted to get access to the genome. So, so this should actually be able to really make an incredibly engaging experience for, for our customers. So I would encourage any of you who are interested to actually go to the site. We have the beta program that is launched, and, um, and, and, um, and, and participate. And uh, that's it. This is the first time I've ever been early on a talk. Thank you.